Hello, everybody. Uh, good morning if you're in the Pacific Coast, and good evening if you're in London. Uh, my name is Julian Sefton Green, and together with Kylie Pepler, who I'll introduce in a moment from Indiana University, we're, we've concocted a short series of webinars to explore some of the issues involved in thinking about the new interest in digital making and making and learning that is currently uh, garnering, garnishing a considerable amount of interest and uh, policy um, support on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, the series has brought together a range of speakers to reflect on making and learning, and we're interested in thinking about what is new about digital making. Why now? Some of the reasons may be obvious to do with technology, but also some of the reasons why people are interested in digital making now are also to do with deeper reconsiderations of the point of learning and of how kids learn in the different spaces that they learn. We're interested in how digital making relates to other forms of creativity, both digital and analog. And we're also interested in thinking about how we can best organize these new initiatives in digital making for children and young people. There's a lot of interest on both sides of the Atlantic in uh, questions about how learning relates to young people's experience of formal schooling. And we also want to consider whether digital making is a theme and a field that is best explored in the formal surroundings of a school or college, or perhaps in more informal and community-based settings. We also want to think about what might be the particular difficulties in thinking about digital making. Is it especially difficult to teach? Does it require an arcane and confusing and uh, obscure forms of knowledge? And we're also interested in trying to bring together what's happening in digital making communities, digital maker communities, who are celebrating and sharing their work in maker fairs and hackathons, um, around both, uh, you know, around many places in the world, and how we can link schools and other kinds of education initiatives to these perhaps community based or theme based or um, uh, entrepreneurially driven uh, initiatives. So, this webinar itself is particularly focused on the question of institutions and the new spaces for learning, the new maker spaces for learning. We have two previous sessions where we've explored. Uh, issues relating to uh, physical properties of digital making, so exploring uh, uh, the tangible nature of, of making things and stuff, as well as the whole issue of hardware. And then the second webinar was particularly devoted to questions around coding and programming. And you can find both of those, uh, uh, the, the, both of those are online now through our website, which is makerbridge.org.uk. And can I say now, and I will say several more times during the uh, event, um, we have a hashtag, a Twitter feed uh, relating to this event, and the hashtag is hashtag digital making one word. Please, please, please post your questions there, and we'll try and find a way to integrate your responses and your concerns with the discussion as it unfolds um, today. Right, so um, I'm now going to uh, ask Kylie to talk a little bit more about the particular questions that we want to investigate in today's session, and then I'll introduce the uh, three guest speakers for today's conversation. So Kylie, can I hand over to you, please? Thank you, Julian. And I, I think uh, the audience is really going to enjoy the range of speakers that we have uh, here today and, and their presence both in and out of schools and their, their observations of, of studying learning, of creating communities, and, and uh, what it takes to, to uh, bring kids into the sort of digital making spaces. This week, in particular, we're going to explore some questions. Um, we're going to ask questions like, you know, how can we best uh, connect learners with the new maker communities, um, those working in schools and out-of-school sessions? Uh, we're also going to ask questions like, how can we support schools and teachers to use these new technologies? You know, as we think about, um, you know, bringing digital making into schools and after-school spaces, what does it mean? You know, what kinds of activities uh, would connect to youth culture? What kinds of acti how do we prepare those teachers to teach them? Uh, how much structure is actually needed in those in the um, in those activities? 
And then further, we're going to uh, talk a little bit more about how we credit and validate learners' interest-led inquiries. There's been a lot of talk um, about using badging systems or alternative credentials, uh, uh, as well as portfolio systems. And so how do we recognize the work and the uh, you know, incredible amount of learning that happens in the process of designing these shared artifacts? Uh, and then lastly, um, we're going to ask questions around how can we disseminate these initiatives and make them available to all. So how do we move beyond some of the communities that might uh, be really central in this movement uh, to be more inclusive of learners um, uh, from non-dominant communities? And so with that, Julian, I'm going to turn it back over to you to introduce our speakers. Okay, thanks very much, Kylie. So we have three speakers for today, and our intention is to ask the speakers to make short presentations uh, to you and to each other, and then we'll have about uh, 25 minutes at the end for conversation and questions, which you're all going to send to me on hashtag digital making. Okay, so our three speakers are, and I'll introduce you to them in the order in which they'll speak. Uh, first of all, we have Lisa Regala, who is the, um, uh, works at Maker Ed. Uh, and is the program director there. And Lisa has, uh, uh, if you look at her website or the uh, bit about her on the website, an incredibly kind of varied career as a kind of scientist and science educator. I think that's fair. So she seems to have um, studied and have degrees in chemistry and physics and has worked in uh, various science education centers such as the Da Vinci Science Center um, and uh, in the Museum of Science in Boston and also worked in, um, in, in public education on PBS, uh, public television, uh, also doing this kind of work, and has also had a particular interest in uh, science content and outreach for girls and young women. Uh, and Lisa will talk a little bit more about Maker Ed uh, in her presentation. Uh, the second speaker is Iris Lipinski, who is the CEO of uh, a company called Apps for Good, based in the UK. Uh, which uh, and is div uh, responsible for its um, uh, partnerships and strategy and business model of the Apps for Good company, and, and that was formed in 2009. Um, and uh, Iris um, has been named by the Observer and the National uh, Foundation for Education, Science and Technology as one of 50 Britain's 50 new radicals for her work with Apps for Good. Um, and Apps for Good basically, as I'm sure Iris will talk more than I should, helps young people make their futures with new technology and offers a form of teaching, a form of education that helps young people unlock their confidence and the talent of young people. And the third speaker uh, today is uh, Mimi Ito. And uh, Mimi is a uh, director, uh, works as the research director of the Digital Media and Learning Hub at the University of California and is Professor in Residence and John T. and Catherine MacArthur Foundation Chair in Digital Media and Learning and is by training and habit a cultural anthropologist who has studied new media use over the last 10-15 years, particularly in Japan and uh, the US. She's done graduate work, uh, her graduate work was at uh, Xerox Park and she's written um, a number of uh, books, um, many of which may be known to some of you out there about um, uses of uh, portable technologies um, and most recently a co-authored book has been very important in um, defining qu new qualities of learning with informal uh, digital creative use and the, the, the book is called Hanging Out, Messing Around and Geeking Out, Ki Kids Living and Learning with New Media. So those are our three speakers today and first of all I'd like to turn to Lisa who will uh, make a short presentation about the work she's been doing in Maker Ed. So over to you, Lisa. Thanks. Sure. Thanks, Julian. Thanks, everyone. I'm really glad to be here. Um, as Julian said, my name is Lisa Regala, and I'm the program director for the Maker Education Initiative. Um, I am a scientist science educator. Um, I do have a degree in chemistry. I actually don't have a degree in physics, but I do have one in theater, which I think um, is a really neat combination for making. And um, theater is actually where I learned most of my making skills like welding and woodworking and, and things like that and costume design so I'm really happy to have that as part of my background but um, I'm here today to talk a little bit about Maker Ed, who we are, what we've been up to and how it relates um, to some of the topics that Kylie mentioned today. 
So the Maker Education Initiative, uh, if you're not familiar with it, is pretty new. We're a nonprofit. We just celebrated our one year anniversary, and we are really the um, educational arm of Make Magazine. So Dale Doherty, who is the founder of Make Magazine, is also one of the founders of our nonprofit. So we are a separate organization from Maker Media and the magazine, but we are obviously very closely connected with that group. And um, our big mission is that we want to see every child a maker, and we want to see making in all communities, and that all children have the opportunity to make. Now, um, as an organization, we are not a direct service organization, but we do help expand and build the capacity of youth-serving organizations to allow opportunities for kids to make. And um, one of our big goals is to help others network, and I'm really curious to talk more about that today because we've um, done an experiment with that with our first program called Maker Core, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what we did with that and helping to connect learners and makers online. Um, but we're really interested in doing more of that nationally and helping connect all of these wonderful grassroots efforts in making that have been happening. Um, around this country and around the world uh, with each other so that people can learn from each other and expand on what they're doing. So let me tell you a little bit about what we've done with MakerCore. I'm going to uh, share a couple things, but the first is I'm just going to share, let's see, our my website. So um, MakerCore, if you go to makered.org um, slash MakerCore, um, you can see a little bit about the program. There's a Google map on there. We are, um, our pilot program that we launched, we are in 19 different states around the US um, and we have 34 different host sites around the country. And host sites are libraries, their schools, their museums, um, both children's museums and science museums, maker spaces. So we've got a large variety of organizations that are part of MakerCore this year. Um, if you're interested in and being a host site for next year, there's a form on there that on our website that you can um, fill out. But what we've asked these host sites to do is host Maker Core members for this summer uh, to help lead programs with with kids and families. And um, a Maker Core member is in general a young adult. Most of them are around 18 to 24 years old, and uh, we rec recruited them and then developed them in a spring development camp. Uh, this this spring to help prepare them for their summer experience and so part of um, our you know our mission in, in recruiting these folks was infuse some different views into these organizations and to bring different types of makers into science museums and places they might not have been so we've got you know computer engineers artists architects teachers we've got a lot a large range of um, maker core members that are involved and uh, we're, we've been really excited to see what they're doing. So how we've been connecting them online um, is mainly through this Google platform uh, that we're using today. So we've been using Google Hangouts pretty extensively. Um, we've got every week we do a one hour um, a live Hangout that has, uh, we focus on different topics, so things like you know, including different audiences, um, creativity, the use of language with children. We focus on safety each week. We bring in some experts in the, but we also use our Maker Core members each week in those um, in those hangouts. And each one of them also got what we call a possibility box. So they also received a physical box of stuff that um, each week in our eight week development camp. Uh, was themed on. So we, we did squishy circuits, we've done art bots, we had some freely developed projects as part of that too. And we had some questions framed around these possibilities. And one of the things that we were so um, excited to see is that we've linked this to an online community. So we have a Google community set up where everyone can post uh, what they're doing, share and support each other. Um, in addition to having set up these smaller cohorts of people, so about seven or eight um, cohorts of Maker Core members get together each week and do their own hangout, and then they post a little report about that on the site as well. 
And I think um, one of the things that's been just really inspiring to us uh, is that the array of different projects that have been developed by these young adults when given the freedom to do so. So, you know, although we provided some, some tools for art bots and squishy circuits and things like that in the kit, we just saw this huge range of, um, of project ideas that really came out of it and people taking it in directions that were really based on their interests and experience. And so we kind of feel that we have this really neat um, database of, of stuff and cool projects that's right now in a closed community and, and we're trying, we know that's possible in other places too and how do we um, collect those projects and, and share them out more widely has been one thing that we've been thinking about a lot. And the other thing that's also been really interesting is this uh, connection that has happened with all of our Maker Core members in this totally online environment. So many of these Maker Core members have never met in person. Um, through these eight weeks, we, we developed these cohorts so that um, they would be meeting people from different places around the country and could share different ideas. And many of them have formed really strong bonds. They want to find a way to get together. We're trying to find ways um, to connect those that are working geographically um, close this summer to, to be able to meet in person. But there's been some really strong connections formed through this, um, you know, totally online camp that that we found to be really interesting. And then as part of their building of the community and um, and working this summer, we're, we had a whole session on documentation and really thinking about building uh, their online, online portfolio for themselves to take out into the workforce, um, but also an online portfolio to help us detail and capture what happens in these schools and museums and everything this summer. Um, so that we can really have a place to connect that. So we've been, uh, a lot of them had started different kinds of, you know, Tumblr and, and different sort of blog sites and things like that. Some of them are just using the Google community itself so that you can search by their name and kind of see a collection of the work that they've done. But we've had some really unique um, things happen with that as people want to find different ways to capture what they're doing to be able to share it with others. Um, so that's a little bit about Maker Core. There's one other quick thing I wanted to mention before I'll, uh, my time is up, and um, and I just wanted to share one more site, and that's another um, kind of totally online initiative. This is actually being run by Maker Media, so our for-profit uh, sister company, but um, Maker Media is running a Maker Camp, and uh, you might have participated in the past. Um, it started uh, in 2012, um, but They've had, they had about a million participants last year. It runs for 30 days. It's a free virtual um, summer camp for teens. So um, anyone can participate for one day or for all 30 days, but there's different camp leaders during those days um, that, that do that. And this year they're actually trying to kind of incorporate an in-person element to it as well, where you can become an affiliate site or actually a, a physical place where people can gather to take part in this um, in this camp and make things with each other um, in a room while you're watching um, the camp counselors virtually. And so there's more information on, on the site, Maker Camp, um, but I just wanted to mention that as well as another really neat way to help try to connect people um, around making through, mainly we've been using Google Hangouts. Okay, thanks ever so much, Lisa. We're gonna come back to you for questions and discussion later. And don't forget, please, those of you who are out there, Hashtag digital making. We're getting a few questions in, but we know there are more. Can I pass over to Iris now, please? Iris Lipinski from Apps for Good. Sure. So um, great to great to be part of this uh, webinar. I'm already learning a lot, so part of the benefit for me is to actually listen to the other speakers. Um, what I wanted to do today is to give you a quick overview of what we're doing with Apps for Good and some of the thinking behind it. Um, to um, to give you a flavor of why we do things. And I think one of the important things to, to mention at the beginning is like the parent organization of Apps for Good CDI and also what we're doing with Apps for Good today is uh, based on one key assumption, um, and that is that technology is um, something to get other things done. Um, and that can be a great tool to um, enable communities, to empower people, and to change the world. So we don't think technology for technology's sake is the way forward. Um, but that's just sort of a, a thing to put things into context, what I'm going to talk about. Um, so there are three big pillars we have 
And if we go to the next slide, uh, you can see that um, one of the big pillars from CDI has uh, been the educational model. Um, CDI was founded in Brazil in the mid-1990s, and there's a famous Brazilian educator called Paulo Freire, who basically said people learn best when they uh, focus on problems they're passionate about. Um, and so we've, we've used that educational model, and we've also used the second big uh, is problem solving. So we're asking people to come up with a problem they're passionate about, um, they want to address. It has to be legal. It can't be purely entertaining or purely commercial. But it can be a game. It can be uh, a commercial app that addresses a problem. And then the third pillar is technology. So um, we're uh, now doing three basically things, and that is uh, mobile social web. So the key things we've learned over the past few years, we started out with mobile apps, but we're now integrating all those three things together based on HTML5 primarily. Um, so to give you a sense of what the outcome of that is, uh, I think the best thing to do is to give an example of one of the apps that was created by one of our students. Um, so the student you see um, is Mohima. Uh, she comes from a girls' school um, in uh, the east end of London. Uh, she's Muslim, as you can see with the headscarf. And the problem, she and her group of uh, fellow students, um, three other students, four of them, wanted to solve is that their parents primarily speak Bengali and their teachers speak English. And um, that works well when um, the girls have to translate, you're doing really well in school, uh, you're motivated. It doesn't work so well if, uh, if actually uh, the, the message is you need to work harder, you're a bit lazy, you're not paying attention. So the app they created is a very simple way to facilitate parent-teacher conferences on simple conversations about attendance, um, exams, etc. Um, so that is one of the examples. Um, this year we had about 1,500 teams, um, and we've done like hundreds of apps and seen hundreds of app ideas from young people. Um, so for us, the key thing to do is that um, in the in the STEM term, there are three letters missing, and that is an A, an E, and a D. Uh, the A is for the arts, so design, drama. The E is for entrepreneurship. Um, and sorry, and the D is then for drama. So um, what we try to do is that um, a lot of people only focus on the narrow bit of science, but I think if you can't, as a tech entrepreneur, you can't convince other people to buy your products, uh, give money, um, commercialize it, it actually doesn't really work. Um, so that's sort of on the next slide where we see sort of the, the course framework we have covers all of those areas. And I'm going to talk about all those five things uh, which you'll see on, on the page. It's like we, we're doing initially a, a crash course in app development where you can learn some of the lesson learns of everything that has gone wrong in uh, previous students' apps. And there are a lot of lessons learned from that. And then students come up with an idea, um, they scope that idea, they then build a product, and they uh, pitch that product at the end of the cycle. And ideally, they go through that process more often, but that's sort of the framework. Um, this year, the school year, we've been in um, a bit less than 100 schools. We had about 6,000 students, actually. And uh, for September this year, because we're closing recruitment for UK schools pretty much now, uh, we'll have at least 20,000 students, probably more 25, um, in 300 to 400 schools across the UK. So it gives you also a sense about that we're growing quite quickly as well. Um, on the next slide, um, you can see how we actually interact with different audiences. Um, so the key audience we directly work with are teachers and schools. So we give them content and we give them training. Um, the second big group of people we bring in are experts. So we have hundreds of people volunteer with us in a very specific way, and that is providing feedback to students on the ideas they're working on. Um, and they can do that via Google Hangout. They can do that via Skype. Um, that's the default option. If they want to, they can also go physically into schools. Um, then we have a range of corporate partners who um, half of it supply some of the funding we have, but also supply volunteers who are experts. Um, from those tech companies. And then once students have completed courses, they become our alumni, and only then we actually directly engage with them. Before that, they're within the school. Uh, and as I like, um, bringing those audience together is actually how we can add a lot of the value. Uh, one of the things I want to talk about is, is the model of the educator and the education model behind what we do, um, because it, 
we are using quite a different approach and I think a lot of the changes you see in schools today um, are just more obvious in, 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 the, um, in the technology subjects and, and how people work with technology. And that is in the past you always had a teacher at the front who disseminated knowledge to students. So I call that the fountain of knowledge model because the knowledge actually sits with the teacher. Um, the way how we run courses uh, with Apps for Good is, I, I call it the rock climbing model, where the setup is, is quite different, and that is your students climbing up um, on the wall. Um, you actually have the teacher who's holding the rope at the bottom. So the key role is, A, to, to, to understand what they're doing, but also before they crash, it's a safety rope, so the, they don't hit the floor as hard as they would do in real life. Uh, and then the other guys who are standing there are our experts. So people who have traveled the journey before and who can give advice on things to look out um, and, and, and sort of to look for. Um, that model is not completely correct because we ask students to pick their own ideas. So as a teacher, you would on average have five of those ropes and teams would climb five different rocks. Uh, and that, I think, gives you a sense about what we actually expect teachers to how to change some of their professional behavior and, and their, their skill set is actually, it's, it's quite a different skill set. Um, to give you some idea, if you go to the next slide, about so some statistics, is that we've grown quite a lot. Um, we actually had 6,000 students this year, and it's like we're looking for 20 to 25,000 by September. Um, that data was from last year in terms of girls we have on courses. Um, this school cycle, as far as I know, and we're currently getting the, fa the final numbers for who closed the course, 52% uh, of our students were girls, um, and um, we had, uh, as you also can see, we had a significantly higher proportion of um, people from ethnic backgrounds, and a higher proportion of uh, young people from um, low income slash deprived communities. Um, if you go to the next slide, you can see um, basically how, what the shift has happened for us in the UK, and that was driven by policy shift that the previous school year, um, the vast majority of what we did was an after-school activity. This year, the vast majority of what we did was part of the timetable. And that is because there's been a change in the policy in, in the UK that gives schools the freedom to decide what they want um, to do as part of the technology curriculum. Um, and that also has obviously driven quite a lot of our growth. Um, and then on the next slide, you can see some of the um, some of the benefits students get, and is that like because we actually teach new product development rather than um, coding specifically, that makes up maybe a fourth now going forward of the new course uh, framework. Um, students learn quite a lot about um, some technical skills, but then also things about who they want to become, what they're good at. Um, so, do you rather enjoy marketing, or do you enjoy more the design aspect, or do you enjoy, enjoy more of the coding aspect or the public speaking aspect? All of those things help for them to, to figure that out. And, and then there's also an element about confidence and understanding who they can actually become. Um, and there's an impact on teachers as well. And then the next thing is, is like for us now going forward, everything we do is open source. So, we actually um, creating a, a new way how we're hosting all of the content we have, um, and that is all covered under Creative Commons license. So um, when we stopped tracking, in March last year, 80 organizations in eight countries had accessed our content, and what we want to do now is to revisit that, and in the next few weeks, we'll um, give people a much easier way to access the content and then just use and reuse it in a way they see fit. Um, we have, for example, some schools in Seattle now who've been accessing our content despite big health warnings, but uh, they, they make it work now for themselves. Um, that's all I have, so. Thank you very much, Aris. We'll ask you to come back to some of the health warnings, uh, maybe in conversation. Can I hand over now to uh, Mimi, uh, Mimi Ito? Great, thanks, Julian. And it's really great to hear about uh, these amazing efforts that you both are involved in. Uh, I'm going to be speaking uh, more from the position of a researcher, and I want to talk about uh, this, some of the work that I've been doing around young people's uh, interest-driven learning. And um, if I can get my screen share to work here around uh, this model of uh, 
connected learning that we've been developing to try to connect our research to sites of practice. And we feel that the connected learning model really applies to any range of learning environments and content, but I think it has particular resonance for activities that are centered around making and production. And as you can see in our infographic, the production-centered piece is really central to the model. And uh, the really the model is about what how can we support learning environments that integrate young people's uh, interests, their passions, uh, together with a supportive peer culture, uh, but also connects those interests and their social activity to academic outcomes, to career opportunities, and to civic engagement. And as part of this work, uh, you know, that's funded by the MacArthur Foundation's Digital Media and Learning Initiative, we're really working across uh, research as well as innovations and in practice to try to understand uh, how we can both uh, develop a deeper understanding about how the model works, uh, but also to see if we can put it into action. On my end, um, a lot of my interest in this grow out of research that I've been doing for a long time on uh, how young people are learning in the wilds of the internet around their interests. And a lot of that has been connected to uh, the kinds of productive activities that come out of young people's uh, engagements uh, with their interests, with popular culture. And really this uh, uh, understanding uh, this appreciation that I have for the fact that all young people really are makers but not all young people have their making and creative activity connected to things that may be recognized in schools, that might be recognized in the broader community and adult worlds that open up opportunities for them. So my question is really to say, how can we start to reach out to all of those sites of interest to activity and engagement that young people have in their social and recreational worlds, not just those young people who already identify as geeks, makers, engineers, but um, every Every kid has an interest. Every every kid has, has a maker. How can we start reaching uh, kids by uh, meeting them where they are? And give you a little bit of a sense of the kinds of interests and communities that we've been looking at as potential opportunities to diversify the pathways into making culture. Um, in honor of our uh, friends across the Atlantic, one of the case studies we have is around uh, fans of One Direction which is a very popular UK boy band. And there's really amazing kinds of making activity that girl fans do around One Direction, ranging from animated GIFs to remix videos to fan fiction. Uh, it's really a generative site of production, but one that is often uh, looked down upon by educators and parents and anyone who's not a teenage girl <laughs> actually but again you know just starting to diversify our imagination about the sources of maker culture uh, we're also doing a case study of professional wrestling again amazing maker communities uh, again diversifying our imagination about the sources and content that can support maker culture uh, with our uh, partners in Chicago who do a lot of work around uh, music, hip hop, and spoken word. Uh, of course, these are content domains that have had a lot of integration into educational contexts, but uh, have really been productive zones for connecting with young people. Uh, my own research, uh, I've done a lot of work on fans of an uh, Japanese animation. Uh, and in particular, uh, for a long time, I followed uh, remix video artists, uh, anime music video makers, who really have an amazing online community that supports pretty sophisticated forms of digital making, all in a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, kind of environment. Uh, we're doing a case study of uh, Ravelry, uh, which is a fiber, <coughs> a fiber arts community. And we've been looking in particular at uh, a community called Hogwarts at Ravelry, which uh, is really about knitters and crocheters who are into Harry Potter. And <laughs> what's interesting about this community is they actually are uh, structured as a school so they have weekly challenges and assignments so this week is to craft something that represents Draco and you'll see the kinds of submissions that they have um, are really pretty amazing uh, of uh, things that are inspired by this particular character that they present to each other on the site and they actually get graded and get peer feedback on it like this beautiful scarf 
and um, these pretty intricate creations that are inspired uh, in, in, in some way by the Harry Potter universe. Um, so these are just some examples of where we're looking for sources of inspiration for maker culture, which I think provides some of the pathways, the kind of making that kids are doing outside of school on their own with their peer culture uh, that you know, there may be opportunities to, to connect in the school context. Now, one area where I think educators have already been doing this work um, in really trying to build the connections uh, from young people's existing recreational and social interests into the school context is in uh, games-based making. So uh, Minecraft, which is an incredibly popular game right now that is built on really a maker toolkit, is something that a lot of educators are actively incorporating into classroom and after-school context already. Uh, and then there's um, you know a really vibrant movement in games and learning that I think is really maturing in a lot of ways in the ability to create uh, those transitional points between the in-school and out-of-school environment and support that. Uh, so the Games Learning and Society group, for example, have been working with Microsoft Research in developing a set of tools called Studio K, which is taking the Kodu uh, game creation platform and really uh, building a community and a tool set for teachers to be able to incorporate in their context. Um, Institute of Play and has had GameStar Mechanic for a while, which again uh, is a game uh, creation platform that uh, they really support support uh, in class use. Uh, Valve, which is the company who created Portal, uh, which has a lot of tie-ins to both making and physics kinds of learning, uh, is uh, increasingly supporting educator uh, uptake. Uh, so those are just some examples, I think, of active work that is having to start bridging those uh, sides of making that are more from the youth uh, world, whether that's gaming or, um, or fandom, into the classroom context, I think there's also increasingly a lot of opportunities to start bridging in the other direction as well in uh, using or connecting school-based content and assignments to broader maker cultures and environments online. Uh, so I'll just give one example of that, like in my own home environment when uh, my son was uh, doing his uh, history class and one of the assignments was to create something um, from the era and he decided uh, to create a catapult and a site like Instructables just becomes a really amazing resource for uh, having um, all of these different examples plus really concrete how-to's for um, creating different catapults and he ended up uh, creating a catapult out of uh, connects which uh, you know are materials that we had at home but again it's not the, that the classroom anymore has the teacher has to provision uh, everything uh, for you know all of these diverse home contexts that people may have or diverse kinds of making materials but environments like Instructables provide uh, this incredible wealth of resources uh, to support uh, the kinds of making activities that one might want to uh, do in the classroom context. Um, DIY.org is another environment that also provides this kind of resource set. Uh, so that was just a little bit of an overview of you know the sort of motivations behind our research and where I see some of the emerging opportunities for connecting in school uh, and educator oriented uh, making to the kinds of existing uh, interest driven making that young people have in the online world. Thank you very much Mimi and thank you very much Lisa and Iris. I think that was very interesting in uh, sketching out a huge range of initiatives um, where it seemed to me that there was quite a lot of common understanding about the uh, and focus on the kind of quality of the experience and the nature of the learning. But in, Mimi went through examples of kind of uh, youth organized, uh, more kind of organic, if that's the right word, uh, ground up kind of uh, organizations. Lisa perhaps was working in a more uh, semi-formal um, organized but not school organized kind of settings. Well, Iris 
talked us through some examples, uh, 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 quite interesting questions of scale, uh, working within the kind of curriculum. And it seemed to me that all three speakers uh, and all three of you um, have been circulating around the question about um, where the knowledge resides and how, base, how best uh, can we kind of capitalize and structure experts who may not be teachers. I just wondered if anybody had any responses uh, to those kinds of uh, challenges, um, um, besides uh, maybe more specific queries which are coming through. And please, everybody else out there, don't forget, hashtag digital making. We've only got a couple of questions coming through from you yet, and I'll feed them through later. But does anybody want to respond to my initial question particularly? Obviously not. As I said, like, I, I, what I, in terms of the expert teacher thing, um, I, I think <clears throat> for me technology education is only the obvious subject where the concept of the teacher knows everything and the students are sort of the vessels that receive wisdom doesn't work because the industry is changing so quickly. But if you look at other subjects, so for example history, obviously if you're a student who is interested in a specific part of history, say Egyptian history, and you read up everything you can find online for three months, you will know more than 99% of all teachers in the world. So I think there's an interesting concept about what is the role of the educator and how they add value. And as I like, from my point of view, teachers have an important role to play with the concept about holding the rope, making sure there is a learning experience and there is an educational model behind it. But I think, especially with technology, um, even trying to attempt to know everything that's happening in that sector in real time is impossible because there's no one who works in the tech industry or, or either who, who knows everything and who can do everything. But how do you find, um, you, I mean, you, you described enormous quantity of work um, working at scale with schools. How do you find in practice teachers who are used to questions of control are responsive to these kinds of challenges of uh, uh, letting go of the reins and bringing in other kinds of expertise? I think uh, we've had very, very positive response about bringing experts in, um, but it's it's a journey that needs to be supported, <laughs> is, is the answer. So I, I think the way how we do it is we program in expert sessions at very specific parts of the course, um, so it's clear for both sides on what they're supposed to be doing, because um, people come from different cultures. And, and the education sector in itself is a specific culture, the technology sector is a specific culture. So, um, so I think it's important to help facilitate, facilitate to do that bridge, basically, to, uh, between um, what is accepted in education versus what is accepted in industry. And that's a journey. So one of the things we've, for example, seen is when people create tech startups, copying from other people is good. If you copy your homework in school, it's generally considered bad. So there's certainly a journey to be traveled about what is good and bad and, and uh, to link those two things. Okay. And, and maybe it, it occurs to me, you know, that, that this, um, this teacher culture, it looks really different in, in online communities. Can you speak a little bit to sort of the peer-to-peer um, the -peer learning that's emerging in these online communities? Right. Well, I think one of the great advantages of uh, trying to connect or leverage what's happening more in those organic uh, wilds of the internet is the fact that you have these authentic communities where it's not like people are defined in a role necessarily as a teacher but that you're providing peer support and everybody is a contributor and everybody is also a critic and an expert to some extent and there is in really high functioning interest group communities definitely a hierarchy of expertise and specialization that you see happening but I think that role of the teacher is much more organic and then you're really it's really about the authentic sharing of passions and interests and that provides a different kind of dynamic than the traditional classroom structure which I think can be very productive if you can get those working together so it's not that I mean I think that these communities suffer from the lack of you know a named role of a teacher and the ties to institutional uh, recognition uh, but I think in an ideal kind of synergy you have that peer supported environment which is very dynamic which feels very authentic where you're publicizing work to a, an authentic audience who's not just the evaluator of your work but some other people who care deeply about the same 
uh, kinds of um, content. And so I think the opportunity with the online space is not just to access knowledge, but to really access social interaction and community around that knowledge. And I'll just say what we've done with uh, MakerCore is um, each week in our eight-week online training camp, we've you know, not only brought in some quote unquote experts to help, you know, be on the hangout, but we've also invited Maker Core members each week. We watch what they're posting on the community. We see that and we know that they are all experts in one thing or another and we kind of um, select them and ask them and we also open it up to anyone that wants to participate to really empower them so that they um, feel that they're, you know, experts as well in these areas. And so we put those folks side by side each week on our on our broadcasts and then um, also ask those experts to join our online community so they can be asked questions at the time too. But um, I guess we're kind of trying to eliminate the here's the expert, here's the maker core member and, and, and make that a little more even so that everyone's, um, it really is a peer to peer collaboration. Great. Thanks. And, and uh, uh, Lisa, how old are the maker core members? In general, they're young adults around 18 to 24. Most of them were college students, um, but we do have a, a variety. Okay. Oh, I'm very struck by how there's a slight difference in culture between US and UK about working with youth in these uh, more kind of organized ways, which I think is an interesting reflection on uh, the way that civic participation is kind of imagined in both kind of countries. Kylie, um, there have been a couple of questions coming in around uh, arts um, and the role of um, art, uh, maker, uh, digital making and uh, maker education and arts education and its, and its difference and similarity from traditional arts field. Do you have anything to add to, the, uh, to that kind of theme, answer those kinds of questions? Sure. I, you know, I, I think that there's such an opportunity here to sort of re-envision the arts education curriculum to be more inclusive of some of the things that we're seeing here. And fundamentally, you know, arts and aesthetics, you know, play through almost all of the examples that you've seen here. Uh, and yet there's a real technical component to them. And that, you know, when I've worked with arts educators in the past, uh, that can be really scary and sort of off-putting, and, and in part because, you know, they have an allegiance to um, some of the older materials they want to see um, those in the uh, you know kind of persist in the classrooms what it means for paint and for uh, 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 clay and all sorts of material that have been at the heart of our arts education um, and so there's there's a few barriers to getting it into that space I think by getting it in there, um, you know, it starts to change the conversation, you know, beyond, um, you know, you think about a couple other settings, you know, our technology classrooms are, um, you know, kind of more the STEM, the science, technology, engineering, and mathematics kind of context. So it become very uh, narrowly technical, and um, and the arts helps to broaden those kinds of things and to help us think outside the box. You know, it's sort of, um, you know, those examples of all of those catapults, um, you know, the artist starts to question what is a catapult and We'll start to re-envision that in a, yet a very, very different kind of way. And so there's certainly a role that the arts can continue to play in this atmosphere. I think there are a lot of tensions to that. You know, a lot of the national discourses want to connect it closer to computer science or to um, engineering or to um, other kinds of things that are happening there. Um, and also to the economic imperatives. And so uh, I, I think part of what we need to kind of keep in mind is that by keeping the art central in that is that we teach people how to be creative with these materials, how to um, think about them aesthetically and compellingly in the ways that we all love our technology. So, um, so I think that by keeping um, the arts really central to that agenda uh, is really good for uh, digital making in the future. Thanks very much. And one of the questions I wanted to ask you, Iris, was around the challenges of scale um, and the whole issue of the um, what kind of the, the best kind of ratios for learning communities that kind of envisaged, because you talked about very large kind of numbers uh, working there. And that we've also had a couple of questions, more sort of practical questions coming in about how we allow students to use banned devices in school settings. I wonder if you had anything to say about the whole kind of question of um, the kind of practicalities of kind of operating at scale and mainstreaming some of these kinds of uh, processes and different ways of working in more conventional settings. Sure. Um, on, on the device side, what we normally do when we, um, the, the model we have is that schools apply to us to become education partners. 
And um, as part of that process, um, they need to make quite a few changes on what is allowed and what is not allowed in schools um, to make uh, to make it possible to run the course and the program there. So um, there are certain sites that need to be unblocked. Um, uh, so typical one is, is, is YouTube. Um, if it's uh, schools are doing the Facebook app part of the course, then they have to do that as well, just for practical reasons. Um, and then you have things around policies around whether young people can use mobile phones or not, uh, what those use cases are, um, to make it consistent. And, and I think students are very good at figuring out you can't just ban mobile phones and then say, let's do a mobile phone app development course. It's, it's um, not very consistent. So there are certain policy changes, and that's why we require to have buy-in from the senior management team within a school and from teachers on the ground. And you need both parts to make it work, because if you don't have the policy buy-in, then um, you can't make some of those changes happen. Um, so in terms of the scaling thing, I think there is an interesting question about, um, from my point of view, we're going through a typical um, ad adoption life cycle. So you have sort of early adopters who, who are really keen to do new things, um, and you then get uh, sort of um, people who, who, who are a bit less conservative, so they need to convince that it's a proven model and that they can uh, use a quite tested model, but that is still innovative. Um, one of the gaps we've been looking at um, to get to the, um, the gap between um, to, to the early majority and certainly to the late majority in an education environment is that you have to give an answer to assessment. And um, I think one of the interesting things we're now looking at is like how can we show that what we do um, um, based on data and, and learning achievement um, that it makes sense. And to also see if there's a more interesting way to assess things like teamwork, collaboration, problem solving that is currently not mirrored in the, in the typical um, standardized assessment frameworks that are being used in most countries. And there's an international task force as well about 21st century skills and how, how collaborative learning can actually also be assessed in a in, in an um, scientific and, and reliable way. Okay. Thanks so much. Uh, Lisa, um, we've got another kind of question here about um, some of the challenges of opening up uh, people to these kinds of initiatives uh, uh, and, and the making that is already going on. Do you have any kind of responses to that? Sure, it's a big um, mission of ours to get making in some more communities and I appreciated what Mimi um, you know, was talking about, about how do we reach those that you know wouldn't already be coming to a maker fair or you know be, be engaging in these activities um, otherwise their parents taking them to a museum or or what it might be um, one thing that that we're doing as an organization is um, partnering with AmeriCorps Vista um, and so we're actually going to be launching that um, this fall as a little pilot and continuing in the spring but we're going to be placing AmeriCorps Vista members in um, different locations around the country that are going to be working specifically to help build the capacity of organizations to um, engage high poverty youth in making and and to see if we can um, find ways to incorporate it into the school day as well. So um, the focus for many of them is might start with after school, um, but in, you know using some of the teachers that that want to engage in that way and then um, and then expanding beyond that but we're we're constantly um, trying to look at different ways that that we can reach those communities that aren't being reached and and this is one of those members but we're also just thinking more globally beyond that about how you know how can we place um, community connectors so to speak is what we're calling them in different different communities around the country that can just help identify um, you know who's the maker in town that would be willing to volunteer their time to go to the community center to help um, bring folks together and so that's a a big part of our um, strategic planning right now is thinking about how we can kind of enable community connectors to bring folks together locally and um, and get more people involved thank you Lisa I think you know that I think there are a lot of lessons to be learned uh, Mimi do you want to chime in with some of your observations um, uh, you know from your various communities 
Yeah, I think the issue of mainstreaming is a really important one, and it really shows uh, sort of the tough slog in terms of infrastructure and policy that we have to work through to reach a diverse range of young people. Um, I love, obviously, the peer-to-peer -peer networking and informal stuff, but we know from that work that when you leave it up to the informal mechanisms, they tend to track a around existing social and cultural clusters rather than really building new kinds of connections and opportunities for young people. So I think that bringing it into school infrastructures is really, really critical to the movement. Uh, and Lisa may be able to speak to this better than I can, but I know that the maker uh, folks have been working with schools to try to kind of reclaim shop spaces within schools. So this may be a, a US specific phenomenon, but you know, there's sort of that traditional vocational ed space, which was the pathway to manufacturing uh, kinds of careers, which has increasingly um, been, been disappearing actually within the US. Uh, curriculum. So there was sort of the home economics for girls and shop for boys. And so there were spaces with equipment and making uh, kinds of capacities. And I think the idea is to try to repurpose that kind of space for a maker oriented pathway and reaching kids who are not within that sort of middle class demographic necessarily of maker culture, but who um, have a more um, historical working class identity attached to um, what that that was historically what shop classes catered to and the, was the stereotype around them. So I think movements like that, which uh, really require, you know, infrastructural and policy commitments on the part of the school, if those are successful, then we may have an opportunity to really move the needle on some of the uh, pathways and opportunities pieces. And I'll just chime in really quick. Um, yes, that's the Makerspace program, and that um, is run out of Maker Media. It's a program that is in a little bit of transition. It might be coming under our nonprofit soon. So, but they have done a pilot program in California and, and doing just that and kind of um, reclaiming shop classes. It's been very successful, and we're looking for ways to continue to expand that. All the resources are available for that online. Thanks so much, Lisa. We've literally got a few minutes left. I'm going to ask all of you for a final. Uh, comment, ending up with Kylie who will close the session. And, and my question to you is, um, is there anything that seems obviously kind of interesting um, and implausible that happens in America and or the UK that couldn't happen in your place, depending on where you're located? That's kind of one question that seems I'm interested in. And, and secondly, the challenge of progressions. How much um, about all of these kinds of th things are kind of starts, fresh starts, and beginnings, but actually all we're doing is raising expectations that we can't then fulfill. So those two kind of challenges, um, I'm going to throw them at you. Who am I going to go for first? Um, Iris, can you face the, in one minute? Um, I, I, I'll try. I, I, I'm not sure if I can give a consistent answer to that, uh, especially the first one. Um, I think for, for me the interesting thing, I'm not even British, so you've probably figured that one out, so I don't even can't speak on behalf of the UK, so I'm not entirely sure if I can speak on behalf of the US and spotting things. I think the, the interesting thing for me, because we one of our trustees just moved back to the US, is like is, is uh, the, the observation that um, there there's so many different things happening, and I think it's a mistake to think that the US is, is sort of one country where things are happening around education. I've been told there are quite a few different things and different states of different approaches. So, um, but I think that what we've seen is like I think there's a common demand between the UK and the US that pure um, assessment-driven standardized learning is highly discouraging for young people. And I think that is quite a global trend as well. One of the um, people we're talking to is in, in uh, Catalonia in Spain, where they have a 25% dropout rate in secondary schools because students are just really disengaged. And I think one of the key things we want to achieve is to, to re-engage some of those students. Um, that leads me to the progression thing uh, quickly. Um, I see Apps for Good as a, as a super taster course. Uh, where you, at best, um, understand what you enjoy and what you're good at. But um, make no mistakes, those 50 hours students uh, spend with us over one school year, um, they won't be professional programmers, they won't be professional designers, marketeers, etc. But hopefully it sets them on a journey, and we're now investing quite a lot in, into our alumni communities to, to continue the journey and to do signposting. 
So one of the things I'm obsessively doing in the UK is, is to map who's in the space and to make sure we all talk to each other because if we don't, uh, I think we're exactly facing the risk you have is that we say, okay, here's a great program from 13 to 16 and now when you turn 16 you have to wait until you're 21 to do the next thing we can offer. So um, I, I'm quite passionate about making sure as a minimum there's signposting to um, different programs because it benefits everyone. Okay, you've got 20 seconds, Lisa. <laughs> um, okay, I'll just say really quickly, I think one of the U.S. Um, opportunities and challenges is with the Next Generation Science Standards that were just released this spring. Um, the inclusion of science and engineering practices in that is, is new to our standards and um, provides a great opportunity to encourage making and creativity and um, processes instead of always just content and also opens the door to assessment that um, was mentioned I think by Iris earlier too about you know how do we think about assessing kids in a different way in thinking about assessing their collaboration skills, their brainstorming skills, their um, collaboration skills as well. Thank you very much. And Mimi, a few final thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I would just underscore what's already been said, which is really our next step is to start connecting the dots between all of these different amazing sites that making has been supported. And I don't think we're in a period where we can really expect that our formal traditional assessment and credentialing kinds of systems can track all of the accomplishments. And we have to build systems that empower the learner and the maker to be able to advocate for their accomplishments, make them visible across different settings, whether that's badges or portfolios or better kinds of linkages between different learning programs. I think that's really the next challenge and opportunity that we've, we have to face. Thank you very much. And the final word to Kylie. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, thank you to all the speakers and, and to all of our viewers. It's been, it's been a pleasure uh, during this Maker Bridge session. I think today especially we explored, you know, the role of collaboration, the role of, um, you know, connecting with others um, in, in, um, in so much of this digital making efforts. And, and you know, it strikes me as, as strange because in schools, for example, uh, we often view that kind of collaboration as cheating. And so how do we start to re-envision our learning space? Spaces, um, so that they really build on these principles of, of real-world learning. Um, and, and so, uh, uh, well, thank you here, and uh, Julian and I are deeply grateful to, to everyone who's been joining us. Thank you very much.